Hello. L Lordy, I'm already running out of time. <laughs> uh, I realize it's a totally bold and almost ridiculous thing to claim to know anything about original voice and then come out to play. Because, geez, I better, I better do something pretty cool. <laughs> so... Obviously, I play a very unusual instrument, and I play it in an unusual way. What, what you heard tonight, um, so far, was um, there aren't too many people who can do it. There's a few. There's a half a dozen of us, maybe. But only one guy really does it like that. And <clears throat> 25 years ago, when I first started playing an instrument almost like this, I had no conception of what I just did now. 
15 years ago, I had maybe a little inkling, and I've just kind of been crawling towards it. Um, so that's kind of one of the things I want to impart here tonight. Um, we're going to start with my biases. I have two biases. <laughs> At least two that I can think of tonight. One is that um, to find your own way is more valuable than going some other, somebody else's other way. That's my bias. <laughs> Hopefully we can dip into more than lip service to that. Um, my other bias is that um, people have a tendency to think that smart people think up clever things and that makes them original. And I think that's total bullshit. <laughs> they just work and they find an idea that's core to their center, that's authentic to them, and they just work it and work it and work it. And eventually, you start here with everyone else, and then eventually, you're over here. And then you just keep going, if you keep going, because your voice kind of develops. Anyway, so those are my two biases. We're talking about original voice which in a way is absurd that we're even having this conversation because how can you not be authentic? Right? Well, but yet we know some people feel more authentic than other people and some people have their voice more honed. My, my uh, view is that they've just taken it and gone further and they've materialized it and they've formed it probably better than others. Um, one of the disadvantages you have or one of the things that takes you away from your authentic voice is almost anything that comes from the outside. So any market forces, any peer pressure, any, anything from outside probably isn't helpful to you because what I'm talking about is doing something that's never been done before. So where can you look for it? Nowhere, except for this path that I'm suggesting. So it's a, little, it's a little absurd of conversation, but we're having it anyway. So where do you look? The first thing is where do you look? And for me, what I've discovered, I should add in here also, not only do I play this strange instrument, but I've been coaching artists in the creative process for about four years now. Mostly musicians, but a couple of painters. So I'm gonna be drawing on examples from these guys as well, because I've, what, what I've, what I, what I'm, what I'm on about here is that there's no map to go where no one's been before. So you can't go to jazz sax class or detective writing class and find your voice. But yet there, if you take the, if you look at people's process and you take the stuff out of it, there's still some markers that I've discovered along the way. This is a key one, noticing. Oh, you can't quite see it, it says notice. Notice is the doorway. What you notice is the key to your stuff. Um, and, you know, like, ev like right now, or if we went out on the street, everything's happening, but you're gonna hear something, you're gonna see something, you're gonna all just even, just that you even notice anything is, is a link to your, your own voice. And, um, the, the first thing to do is notice what you notice. So it's this weird kind of helpful self-consciousness. Uh, and what I try to do, and I'm gonna just go through a couple of my examples really quickly, I won't go through them all. I kind of think of myself as a factory that's got all these physical and emotional and mental things, and I just kind of watch myself. And so, oh look, uh, I really like it when the chords go up but the voice leaps down. I don't know why. I don't care why. Why doesn't mean anything to me. I just noticed that. If it's a female voice, I get... It's more. I don't know why. So I, 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 we're going to talk about the toolbox in a second. So I noticed that and I put it in my toolbox. Um, the other thing that I notice that I really like is when I'm flipping the radio. only time I listen to the radio is in the car. I'm flipping through the radio and I flip and there's a song usually beginning and I can't tell what's happening. I don't know what key it's in. The rhythm feels all weird. And then before it settles in, there's just a bliss for me about that kind of disordered 
ungroundedness. So I noticed that. I love it. You can't program it in, um, except we're musicians, so that's kind of one of the things I like, so I tap into it. Um, they have the, we have the anti-notice, um, which, which for me is when you notice more in your field, because th this stuff applies to any field. When you notice that um, there's something missing in the field, even that you would notice that something is missing means it's probably for you. So one example I had when I was in college years ago, and I was really grooving on Steve Reich and Philip Glass in the early days, and I thought, you know what, nobody's, th this kind of music, it does this pulsing, amazing rhythmic thing, but nobody's doing it with the full-blown romantic orchestra. Not romantic in the sense, but just the big orchestra. And I thought, well, that kind of looks like if nobody's doing it, then I got to do it. So I started kind of working on how orchestration works and this and that. And then somebody played me this John Adams record, the guy who wrote the opera Nixon in China, one of the strangest, I won't be derogatory, but one of the weirdest operas. He played me this early record and I was like, that guy totally did it. He totally did the Steve Reich equals Romantic Orchestra thing. So for me, it was like, okay, that's done. I don't need to do it. Thank God I don't need to do it. He's already 10 years ahead of me. I wouldn't be that good at it, but I, 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 it, it was a kind of a key, like, oh, I see something's missing, so I'll go that way. Um, I'm probably going to move on here so we can get further on, but uh, the, the, the second bottom one, improvisation must be the solution, is one thing that I discovered that in my working strategies when, um, when I was younger and I used to record, I used to record on a four-track cassette, if you guys ever remember that. Um, proof that sound quality and music aren't really connected, actually, because I used to listen to a cassette in my car with the windows down. Vinyl recorded to cassette on my car. Did I not hear music? I heard music just fine. Um, what I used to do was I would make a recording project and I would have a four-bar section where I didn't know what I would do there. This is the days where you can't cut it out, so I had to come up with a solution. So in the process, I would either improvise or compose something in there as the piece went on, and I was forced to stretch myself. I noticed I like that. It goes in my toolbox. Um, and the kind of culmination of that is this record I did about a year and a half ago where a drummer gave me a 51-minute drum solo, if you can believe that. I hate drum solos. Two minutes is enough for me, but Marco's an amazing drummer and he talked me into it. And I wrote an entire record to his 51 minute drum solo. Actually, seven of us did. There's seven complete records. And it was the hardest thing I ever did. And I realized this goes back to my original recordings where I gave myself this unbelievable challenge and it just got worse and worse. Or better and better, because the results are fantastic. It works for me. So moving on. How do you develop it once you notice these things? Okay, so you take all these little noticing things and you put them in your toolbox. And what do I mean by a toolbox? I mean, you have to have some way to keep track of your ideas, otherwise you can't develop them. You're just relying on your uh, mnemonic sense, which is not very efficient, at least for me, at least at this age. But even as a kid, it didn't work that well. So the toolbox is like, in a way, it's trickier for musicians. You know, a writer can write ideas down. A painter can have a sketchbook. Musicians, you can't, you can record things, but you can't really look at two audio recordings at the same time. So I'm, I, I'm just, I brought here what my toolbox looks right now, looks like right now. And it's really just a list of my devices, things that I do. Not only that I like, but I do. So I have rhythm, melody, harmony, orchestration and form, and there's different things in here that I like, certain ways that I like harmony, certain kinds of rhythmic things that are in my vocabulary that I've said, oh, I like this, I wanna pursue this, I'm good at this thing. And so now I have this little toolbox, and whenever I'm working, I grab a couple of those things and run with them, as opposed to grabbing somebody else's things. Just the fact that they're on here makes them more mine than yours. Right? Your, your list would look completely, utterly different. And what you would make from this, as opposed to taking vocabulary off the shelf, is going to be more yours. And as you kind of refine this, you start to notice 
there's something underlying these things. There's something underlying the way rhythm excites me that's just me and not anybody else. So that's how you go. That's one way to work with a toolbox. Um, genre work is kind of what I call, is kind of the opposite of this. Genre work is where you do, you make something that's already been made before. And we all know romantic comedies, detective novels, light jazz, country western. Uh, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do those things. Maybe that's where your voice is, whatever. I'm just saying that if you're heading down your own path, you have to be really careful messing with this stuff. That in a certain, at a certain points along the way, you have to let stuff go that's not serving your aim for your own authenticity. For me, I kind of built in a thing by, by playing a strange instrument. I changed my tuning, actually, in 1986 to a fifth space tuning instead of fourth space. I can't play anything that I used to play. And as soon as I pick up a regular guitar, the Allman Brothers licks come right out. And, and Leonard Skinner, which is not my voice. So I kind of like to protect myself. Another way of protecting yourself is not going to romantic comedy if you want to do something else. But you got to make money sometimes. So sometimes I, dip in, I do dip into it. Um, I do a lot of, have done a lot of stuff for TV. Um, but I always try to bring something from my toolbox in there. A little, I don't know, a little rhythm, a little the way that I use harmony. I'm actually not very good at genre writing. Some people are really great at it, so they could have a different opinion. But that's my opinion. Um, the other thing is just to make tons of stuff. I think we probably all know that, but it's hard to, it's hard to make ourselves believe it, even me. Like I think that, uh, that at least when you're developing your idea, a new idea, you think it's really precious and you have to take care of it. But the truth is, if you just make 100 of them, you get really good at it. It's proven, actually. Um, and then the, the next thing that I like to use, and I notice other people using, is you, you've got all these things in your toolbox, but now you want to actually make something. And what I find is people, uh, if you have a great burning question, you're, you're set. And here's some examples of some questions. I have my own. Um, these are not made up. These are people I know and worked with or actually uh, coaching clients I work with. Number four, can the rhythm speed up and slow down but stay on the grid? This is a very amuso thing. Some of you guys may not know what I'm talking about. But basically, if the pulse is going, da 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 This drummer came to me with that question. Like, how, can you do that? How do you do it? Should I do it? Is it a good idea or a bad idea? I don't, I don't know. I don't care about whether... I mean, any idea is a good idea. So we worked with that. And uh, he's a perfect example of how if you take a question and just pursue it and run with it, you end up with a body of work. It's the, it's the most direct method. We tried to answer his question, and it actually didn't sound that great. But in the process, he discovered something else. And he ended up rebuilding his drum kit to be two complete small drum kits that he played with his right and left side of his body and uh, built a whole vocabulary of playing different rhythms on the right and left side of his body and came up with this great percolating amazing groove music and has written about an hour's worth of music to it now. Now after about a year and a half he's on to this question and it, it sounds really different than a year and a half ago. He's got this body and experience with it. Um, I'm just going to read you a couple of the questions I have worked with. Um, how to write instrumental music that is neither jazz or classically structured. These are very muso, but I'm a muso. So um, I really wanted to do instrumental music that didn't sound like jazz or classical. As soon as you put a voice on something, it becomes instantly interesting. Take the voice away, and now you're left with this incredible challenge of how do you make it engaging Different people have had those answers, and now we can pull those off the shelf. So I was looking at ways to, to challenge myself. I think I have come up with answers. Um, I'm very interested in story. So some of my questions that I pursued, how does a storyteller speak so that the story is the audience's story? And on and on and on. How do you, how do you have drumming without sounding like a drum kit? 
How do you bring an audience into alert state and into an, an, into an alert state? These, if you pursue them, you end up with a body of music or film or whatever. I see my four minute mark coming. Okay, now you've made your amazing thing and you're ready to present it. James doesn't even have his clock out. He doesn't even know. <laughs> Presenting is really simple. Selling your thing is really simple. You guys ready for the key? It's so simple. There's really nothing more than you need to know is this. That's it, that's your key. Anything less than that is just hollow hype. And we all see through it, and we're all, we all have access to the entire history of recorded music, film, books. Why not make something amazing? Failing that on the pathway, at least be fucking authentic, because that's your best chance of at least being unique, right? So that's my, but I do have one little business thing here. Actually, when James and I first started talking about this talk, I had a lot of industry things in, and I put them in because I thought that's what you guys would want to hear because, you know, this is an industry thing, and James was like, screw that. This is the, the let's go for the, the meat here. So, but I do have one little point here. You can't, you can't be an artist in any way unless you're financially independent. That does not mean rich. That just means your outgoing money is way lower than your incoming. There's no, way, no other way to do it. In, in my field, you don't make any money for six to 24 months on any project. So not only do you have to overlap, but you, you have to be able to live for six to 12 months with nothing coming in. So generally that means cutting your expenses and doing everything as cheap as possible. Nowadays we can do that better, so. That's my little, my one business tip. I see the three minute mark, how are we doing? Okay, so establishing yourself, and I'm doing an overview here obviously, at this point. Persistence, persistence, persistence. Uh, this is a clip from Jan Svankmeyer. Do you guys know this filmmaker? So Svankmeyer is a guy who's a perfect example of this. You don't know if his films are cartoons or what. He uses claymation, he uses stop-action humans, he uses live-action humans. He, in his film Faust, which is incredible, he uses puppets, life-size puppets, mini puppets, everything to tell this story. And he's just been relentless in this path, developing it. Not everything do I like, but who cares? Um, and the, I, I actually got this term, the pers persistence of vision, because uh, when I was living in New Mexico, I was at the Taos Film Festival, and they have a Persistence of Vision Award, and they gave it to Svank Meyer the year I was there. And he, you know, he exemplifies that better than anyone I know. So if you persist, hopefully the world will embrace you. But you know what? If they don't, who gives a shit, right? <laughs> okay. Original voice. I'm, I, I, I think I fairly well resisted being esoteric here. I'm just gonna zip by this. Why is that original voice do we think of as first? I have no answer for you, you ponder that. <laughs> okay, why, do, why go this way? Why do this path? There's a lot easier paths. The challenges are crazy, actually. And they're great, but there are challenges. These are a few. And, one of the things that I get with my coaching clients is after six months or 12 months where work, they were still working on an idea like, man, is this, is this how long it takes? Am I, is there something wrong with me? Am I going too slow? You know, it's like, I feel like I've just been working myself down into a hole. And I was like, yeah, that's what it's like. That's what it's like. And they're like, well, it must get better. And I was like, nope. <laughs> it doesn't get any better. Actually, the more you go, the more uncomfortable it gets. And, and not, just, not just the financial uncertainty, really. I mean, that's whatever. But just this, this sense of, do I, am I on the right path? Do I know what I'm doing? What I made back then was cool, and I don't know about this. So, so there we go. Are there rewards? You bet there's rewards. Look at them.
Okay, on to the real rewards. <laughs> um, I think the most important thing is that you get to do what only you do, as opposed to trying to ape somebody else's path. You know, how can you beat that? It sucks if nobody calls you for that. Well, then you just make your own shit. But, you know, if you persist, you get, you get called for what you can do. And it is true that if you work towards your own authenticity, you have a longer path. Otherwise, you're just jumping genres. And, and why, in my view, why do something that someone else has done? Probably there's people out there who do it better than you, unless you're the frickin' best light jazz saxophone player in the world. I don't know. No derogatory t t to all you jazz saxophone players there, but just an easy pick. So, <laughs> I like jazz too. <laughs> so, That's it, guys. So, um, found it again. No need to pitch yourselves. That was real. You've all earned your BFA. Um, and thank you, Trey Gunn, so much for doing that. Do you guys want to hear another performance? We're your oyster. Thank you.